Jack Teagarden is on the party line. And Jack, of course, is one of the giants of jazz. Hello to you, Big Gate. Hello, how are you tonight? It's nice to have you on the line, and once upon a time we were talking about, uh, oh, a magic name, Johnny Mercer. Yes, yes. If I mention Johnny Mercer to you, uh, I imagine you think of things like Casanova's Lament and what else? Well, I'll tell you, the first, when I first met Johnny Mercer, he had just written a number with the Hoagie Carmichael called Lazy Bones, written the lyrics to it, you know, and uh, he and Hoagie took the uh, the prize that year for the most popular tune with the ASCAPs, and uh, so uh, I met him then when he, he joined Whiteman, and then he used to write material for you and I to do, you know, like uh, Featherwell to Harlem and Christmas Night in Harlem. Then uh, he went out to the West Coast, and uh, he was writing for pictures. And he wrote uh, The Waiter and the Porter and Epps Fairs Made, and, uh, oh, he just kept on going then, and he's written so many wonderful things. Not only from uh, the rhythm tunes, he's just written beautiful tunes like Laura on those. And I think he's just the uh, most wonderful writer that I've ever known, and he's a wonderful boy, too. Jack, uh, in thinking about writing for you know, jazz and and, and bands and so forth. You, you've probably heard a great many writers. Are there any other creators for jazz itself that stand out in your mind? Well, Hoagie Carmichael does, very definitely. Uh, he wrote some wonderful things. Uh, a tune called New Orleans that you don't hear very often. And, of course, he wrote uh, one called, well, you know, Star Stardust is the most popular tune according to... Uh, reliable information that has ever been written. That and the St. Louis Blues. I mean, it's played more and recorded by more companies than any tune. And uh, I think Hoagie's ideas are wonderful. That Skylark and all those things. They're beautifully melodic, aren't they? Yes, they are. They're truly, uh, really American music. And another one is uh, Willard Robinson. I was going to ask you about Willard Robinson. Uh, used, you worked with him, didn't you? Yes, when I was uh, a teenager. I worked with Willard when I was about, oh, 15 years old. And uh, he wrote music like The Man Upstairs and another one called uh, It's So Peaceful in the Country. It's a beautiful tune. And uh, one called Old Folks. And one of my uh, favorites is uh, one called Old Pigeon Toad Joe. It's about a character on the Mississippi Delta. You know, one of those uh, easy-going boys that just lives off of the turnip greens and so forth, and it's really beautiful. That's really American music, is just like uh, Foster would have written it, I think. Actually, uh, you've named three important composers, and one whom we tend to overlook, Willard Robeson, Ogie Carmichael, of course, and Johnny Mercer. Yes. Jack, it, it isn't very often that we get around to paying tribute to the people who create some of the ideas that musicians play, and we thank you for your thoughts on that. Well, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Jack, let's do uh, a couple of other things. Uh, All right. I'll just explore with you. How's your time? Oh, I got plenty of time. All right. Jack Teagarden is on the line, and he, of course, is one of the giants of jazz and the voice of the trombone. Jack, uh, I often wonder, since uh, you uh, are a man who is almost uh, institutional, in terms of trombone, who might have influenced you from out of the past to play, to tone, uh, to interpret everything? Uh, well, I'll tell you, I was very fortunate. My mother is a teacher, and uh, she gave me piano lessons when I was pretty young, about four or five years old, and I got a trombone when I was seven. And I think uh, listening to the spirituals, they used to have a lot of the evangelistic uh, meetings in the summer down at home in Vernon, Texas, and, and I used to sit out on the back fence and listen to all those wonderful spirituals, and I think they had more influence on my work than anything. And then, of course, uh, I think the next one to come along was Louis Armstrong, that, oh, he was wonderful. And uh, I was fortunate in working with a, a wonderful pianist in Houston, Texas, by the name of uh, Peck Kelly. And uh, he was playing then, uh, uh, just as, uh, oh, Tatum and all of them did years later. And he still does. He's still very much uh, alive and happy. I just saw him a few uh, weeks ago. So I've had uh, been around some of the best, 
but speaking of what influenced me more, I think it uh, uh, spirituals did. Well, that certainly is an interesting uh, uh, point, uh, the fact that spirituals are really very much the heart of American jazz music, and, uh-huh. of course, uh, the roots of the blues. Yes, definitely. Well, now, one night you and I were talking about the blues, and just specifically, uh, what do the blues mean to you, Jack? Well, I tell you, I, the blues to me, I, I really feel them, you know, uh, and, and they have a very... A sort of, uh, I get kind of misty-eyed uh, singing blues because they they really do come from the heart. Now they don't make me unhappy, but it's uh, like you go to a, a movie that has a lot of wonderful uh, photography and uh, music in it. You know, it, it kind of choke you up, you know, with emotion. Well, I think that that's the way the blues affect me, and I think that uh, the blues played right and uh, by a person who feels the same way. It transmits to the audience a wonderful feeling. I know that blues have affected popular music today in this respect. We've gone through about ten years of what has been called everything from rhythm and blues to rock and roll, and somewhere the blues yes. were lost, at least in terms of their feeling. Yes. Of this current music that's been upon us and been laid over our ears, what's your reaction to the last ten years of music? Well, I'll tell you, I don't... I don't put any music down, but I I do think that somewhere along the line, uh, the musicians themselves have uh, kind of uh, forgotten the fact that uh, the people would love to hear a beautiful romantic music, you know, and especially for dancing. Ro- uh, uh, dancing is a romantic recreation, and uh, when uh, the musicians uh, come on with those big powerhouse arrangements. They're not adaptable to dancing, and they just don't... Uh, I think it's what kind of helped put the dancing away. Now, when the musicians, I think, uh, will come back playing beautiful music, I think that the public will be very glad to cooperate and we'll have dancing again. And uh, then there's, uh, there's room for uh, uh, rock and roll, but, uh, but I mean a little of everything in American culture. You know, not, not all of any one thing. Yes, and uh, Jack, for that uh, very clear statement, we thank you. And we look forward to melodic lines and beautiful reed sections and brass sections that play for dancing, too, because that's some recreation that we've almost forgotten about, in a Uh, sense. Well, I think it's just around the corner. I don't think it'll be long now. Jack Teagarden, expressing his views on American popular music today. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Jack, thanks uh, very, very much. Uh, there are a couple more things I'd like to ask you if there is still time. Sure. Go ahead. All right. Looking backward into the past with a man who is a veteran of music, but who is always abreast of musical trends, let's talk with Jack Teagarden for just a moment. Jack, you're on our tap wire. Oh, good. Hello. And if you'd submit willingly, I, I might just ask you about the days when, oh, say, Jimmy McPartland and Benny Goodman and yourself uh, first hit New York. Actually, you gentlemen represented what was known as Chicago style in music, didn't you? Yes. However, I wasn't from Chicago, but it seems sort of fit right in the picture with them. Uh, I took Glenn Miller's place. Uh, in fact, uh, Glenn kind of wanted me to have his job with Benny Pollock because it was more or less of a jazz band, and uh, Glenn wanted to uh, step out and, and write for it, you know. So, uh, but the van, I'm telling you, we were just a bunch of starry-eyed kids. We got a big kick out of New York, and uh, we knew everybody in town because, uh, well, Red Nichols was uh, at the height of his career, and it seemed like the going was real easy. We met all the finest in New York, and uh, the going was real easy. But we used to spend a lot of time up in Harlem, and we'd always take our horns with us. I think uh, Benny Goodman was about 18 then, and I was about maybe 21 or 22. And uh, they were they were wonderful days. Of course, we spent every cent we could make and get a hold of, but uh, I think I'd do it the same way if I did it over again. Jack, uh, uh, what what do you what was your first impression of Benny Goodman and hearing him play? Well, I still think the same thing. He's the greatest musician I've ever heard. He's just absolutely flawless. He used to go on hour after hour 
and uh, uh, just never make a mistake. He was just absolutely perfect, perfection itself. And I used to admire him so much, you know. And uh, it was kind of mutual. I mean, we we used to like each other's work an awful lot. And I got a lot of things from him in music, and uh, he got a lot of ideas of mine, and it all worked out very well. Here's another thought in your travels around the Harlem area in those early days of jazz, the late 20s. Uh -huh. You probably ran into a gentleman by the name of Thomas Fats Waller. Oh, I knew him very, very well. He was another one of those wonderful writers, you know. He used to almost give uh, some of his tunes away as for ten, fifteen dollars so we'd have a little spending money. We used to all go out together. And I used to say, well, Fats, uh, it's a shame that you went and sold a honeysuckle rose for twelve dollars just so we could have some fun. He said, oh, it took me five minutes to write it. I can write another one in five minutes. He was that kind of a fellow, you know, and uh, we were the very closest of friends. I think that uh, music misses them as much or more than anybody I can think of right now. Of some other personalities that make up this world of jazz, I'm sure Paul Whiteman, although he devoted his orchestra and its uh, more or less musical mission to popular music, he certainly gave the jazz man a great break. What yes, about Pops Whiteman? He's still very much alive and kicking, but... Oh, yes. He just had his 70th birthday very not long ago, and uh, I was with him on that when he cut the cake, you know. And uh, he used to have all those fellows with him. Uh, he wanted the best band in the world, uh, even though uh, at times, I guess the payroll was almost impractical, but uh, he wanted, if he'd hear of somebody that was wonderful, he'd try to get them, and... Uh, and that's where we all had wonderful experience with them. Of course, on that band with you and Paul Whiteman's band, uh, there were many, many names which you could uh, point to today as... Yeah, the late Beck Spiderback and uh, Frank Trombar and Joe Venuti and Bing Crosby, Harry Barris, and oh, it goes on indefinitely almost. What was Bing like in those days? <laughs> <laughs> He's just the most wonderful boy in the world. Had to go lucky like we all were. But, uh, Those were happy-go-lucky days. Yes, they were. Do you think that, uh, of course, you know, every uh, cycle in terms of history affects the kind of music we play? Um, how about just contrasting the kind of music you hear today, which we call jazz, with the kind of music you played uh, with uh, Benny? Well, I, I don't think I've changed very much. I listened to some of the records that I did years ago. In some ways, I can do things that I couldn't do, and I try to improve all the time. I actually practice a lot, and, uh, but uh, there's some things I did then uh, just uh, sound exactly like I do now. I don't think I've changed very much. I don't know whether I was ahead then or whether I'm behind now, but <laughs> I'm sort of what you call it, maybe the middle of the road. I, I'm not, neither too far either way, or the ragtimey or modernistic. I like. I like good music, I like uh, the 30s, like Benny Goodman and Louis Armstrong and all of them played. I think that's America itself. Well, before we uh, wrap up the, this conversation, well, you mentioned Louis Armstrong, and of course you've played many, many concerts with Louis. Yes, I was with his group for about four years. And you started, I, I believe, with Earl Father Hines in the band. Yes, uh-huh. And then you did a wonderful classic. Uh, you and Louis did Old Rockin' Chair together. Yeah. Yeah, well, what is it about Louis that, uh, oh, I don't know, it seems to uh, chemically work on you. You can tell when you listen, when you uh, explore duets like well, I have a 50, genuine, 50 Blues and Rock and I have Jerry. a genuine affection for him. Is If you talk to Louis, if you've ever talked to him, he has the most wonderful philosophy of life, and uh, everything he says is very funny. He's just a natural-born comedian and showman, and he's, he's got such a wonderful big heart, and... Uh, I don't know, when I'm doing something with him, I feel, uh, well, like ham and eggs, like we belong together, you know, working. And uh, we've always been that way. I've known him about 40 years. Jack, this wonderful survey of American music, our thanks to you in this conversation. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.